programming with rules. Okay, so um, a number of years ago, 2012, um, we started a project to implement a control language for the purposes of controlling machinery. Um, and uh, we uh, find that uh, uh, the complications of doing that in traditional equipment is uh, very hard. So um, what we had to have was the ability to talk to real hardware, mostly at uh, industrial voltages of 24 volt, uh, a bit of 415, three phase, that kind of thing. Um, we had to have a way of giving the humans the ability to see what was going on, uh, and we needed to be able to talk to some legacy uh, industrial protocols like Modbus. But of course, we also wanted to be able to talk to things like scales, uh, and that might be RS-232, which is, of course, a very old protocol, <laughs> uh, or uh, just raw TCP ports for the purpose of gathering uh, the weight out of scales. Or um, in our case, we wanted to be able to uh, capture images off of a camera, stills and that kind of thing. So um, that's the beginnings of a, one of our machinery. Uh, it's for the purposes of sampling bales of wool. You're talking about a 180 kilo bale, approximately, well, ranging 120 to 204 kilos. So you're not doing that um, by hand, although they used to. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I actually saw that. So um, going backwards, um, for the reason of explaining why we did this, uh, our company manufactured, has manufactured these machines for something 40 something years. Um, uh, you have to, uh, in the earliest machines, it was electrical timers and sol uh, physical relays, uh, and very simple automation doing that. Uh, then uh, I don't remember a lot of this, I was quite young, but I believe there was a, a Z80 board, it was called a Scorpion board, uh, originally designed, I believe, by a gentleman called John Langsford, uh, and a lot of extra boards. I f don't have a photo of that. Of course, that would have been back on analog film. <laughs> um, we designed further later on a Xilog Z80 board that had relays and everything, and I've got a picture of that in the f a little bit into the future here. Uh, and uh, we also used early PLCs. Uh, and then uh, late 90s, we did a custom-based Linux solution, uh, 70 long meter long sorting machine for sorting bales of wool. That was all very hard. So that's. That's the board that we used for about 20 years or so. Um, so, yeah. So, long-term issues. Um, hard, hardware is hard to support over the very long time frame. And if, it let, if you're not a big company, that's even harder again. Um, so, you then go back to the commercial, and the commercial people make that hard because they want to upgrade things, they want to change things. Their products are only forward compatible, not backward compatible, meaning that if I have this screen here running version one of their system, and four years later they release a new one that's running version two, the binary file that allowed me to create the screens for this is compatible forwards, not backwards. Meaning that once I've upgraded it, I can't use it on the version one. But I've got 20 machines out here there using version one. How do I keep the two things in sync? I have to program in version one and, and then upgrade to version two for one machine. And it becomes a total nightmare. Um, and a lot of the time you have to use external expertise and uh, they don't understand what you're trying to do. They're not expert in what you're trying to do. And that's a big difficulty. Um, so what we did the first attempt, I mentioned it about the project back in the 2000s. Uh, we built a solution based on Linux. We brought in external programmers. Uh, the end result was a solution that worked, but had no future other than that project. You had to write it in C++. It was complicated. So we went back to PLCs again. So what are our requirements? We must retain control. We must somehow reduce the risks to us in the purposes of developing that software. Um, the traditional method of PLCs, uh, if you're going to go for complex programs, you can spend months and months and months writing it, and then months and months debugging it. 
And you can't do that if you go and then say, okay, I want to build a new machine, but it's got 5% difference. You'll spend another de month changing that program to make it work for that new machine. And of course, we want to reuse our code, and uh, we want version, proper version control. So, five years ago, 2012, we decided that um, we had to come up with a way of fixing the solution or where we're going. we were, not, were going to go out of business. We couldn't continue to do what we were doing. So we needed a simple language. Um, it needed to be easy to read, easy to debug, easy to write. So what you see in the front just here um, is a very simple machine that re re it resembles the physical world. So this is a light switch. Its states are either on or off. And uh, that's all it is. <laughs> you, so if you want other things, you think about what makes something, and you do that. By programming out ourselves, we reduce the risk. We also allow for simulation. This language allows us to have a file that has the configuration and a whole lot of other files for the code, and another file for a simulation and all the things. So we can literally say, here's an input, here's an output, here's a motor, here's a hydraulic cylinder, all these sorts of things. We can put timers and everything on those, and when we say turn on cylinder, virtually the cylinder starts extending. And we can say after X period of time, that input comes on because the cylinder extended. You can then fail state stuff and all that kind of thing within that coding. And so the first program that I wrote had all of that. And uh, we put it on the machine. Sure, it didn't work first pop, but every single manual action, I could extend the cylinder, I could retract it, <laughs> all that kind of thing, which I couldn't have done in PLC land. I would have always had some sort of problem in that area. Um, and of course, how do you future-proof these solutions? Well, you use Linux and you use open source software. So our software is BSD or GPL open. And of course, version control everything, <laughs> which was the biggest problem we had with all the commercial solutions. It was very hard to version control. Everything was proprietary. Everything was locked down. So debugging is actually one of the biggest problems in the industrial world. Um, the way they do their debugging is uh, a polling-based solution, and they only show you the I.O. that will fit on your little screen or that you've turned on in the debugger. So if the problem you're having isn't in the area you're looking or in the area that you've got a debug, the, the list of I.O. turned on for, you won't see it. And all in that, you may only get, if you're local, a 1,000 updates a second, one update per millisecond. So that was a significant problem to me. So we had to have a way of handling that problem. And what we decided that we had to be able to describe the state as it is right now. We also had to be able to understand why it was in this state right now. And we had to have a way of seeing the history of what it was. So that's the state changes and the property changes. So we created this language. Um, each machine is a copy of a template. It's describable, describable, uh, describable with its states. Um, all machines run continuously in parallel. Um, and machines can monitor each other depending on how you code them. The tools we developed were, one, we wrote a version of the language that would actually talk to a, an industrial control uh, platform called EtherCAT. EtherCAT's a very interesting uh, commercial product, um, which is open uh, in the sense that you can join the association for nothing and get all the documentation and buy the FPGA chips and all the sorts of things you need to do. Covered by copyrights, but I mean, nothing's perfect. <laughs> um, and with that technology, you can get a thousand digital I.O. points updated in 10 microseconds with a distributed clock of accuracy of better than one microsecond. 
or you could control a hundred axes of robotics control, so servos, that kind of thing, with a hundred microsecond update rate. So extremely fast and predictable. So that was a solution for us, <laughs> and not hugely expensive, and open source tools, actually two different platforms have been written for it, so we had protection in the sense that if one of them stopped being developed, the other one would be available to us with some work. Um, the CW there, which is the, so the actual language, uh, that was designed to be independent of any I.O. and so you can then connect to it with other things to inject the information into it instead of directly driving, say, Ethercat. The I.O. shell is our command line tool that allows us to list, find, describe, uh, turn on tracing, debugging if we want to go really into the, the guts of things, that kind of thing. Sampler is our uh, monitoring tool. It's this streaming tool that just gets a whole stream of data. You can instruct it with the command line to reduce the data and everything, but I find sample everything, grep it down. <laughs> um, and then persistence daemon is our uh, system that stores things that need to be persistent about a machine after a restart. Lots of things, you know, how much time is, how long things will run, where things should stop, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Modbus D was a Modbus uh, client. Uh, at the time, we didn't have our own private HMI platform, so we had to be able to speak to a commercial SCADA panel, and uh, so we were able to restrict what things actually got exp exported out to Modbus. That's the biggest problem with Modbus. You literally have if the thing has 8K of RAM, that 8K of RAM is made available to the panel. There's no control over it, no security, no, no passwords, no groups, no nothing. Uh, and then this device connector, which is what I mentioned earlier on about how to get to information, uh, it's able to make and receive TCP connections and open serial connections with a regex on it for uh, getting the data into a, a format that's useful. Um, there's IO shell. That's a describe of a a, um, an output that was turning on a fan inside the control cabinet for the purposes of cooling the, the control cabinet down. And you can see in there that uh, um, because it's directly connected to an I.O., its parameters are that it uh, talks to a something or other, EL2828, uh, and it's connected to I.O. pin one of that device. So I think that device has eight outputs at two amps per output. Uh, and then further down, um, you can see the um, IO's um, read times uh, and its dependencies. So this is useful for the purposes of knowing who is looking at it. Uh, sampler, that's actually a sample directly out of this little thing down here, um, which is a ESP32 looking at a CO2 sensor. <laughs> So that's something that we've done, is we've been able to take this language and actually compile it down into an ARM micro. So uh, that's uh, rather cool. Uh, we also have a web, basic web interface, needs a lot of work. I'm not a HTML guy. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, what we call Humid, which is our OpenGL-based uh, GUI that's configurable from config files, buttons, uh, text and data entry, page switching, you know, you can write a page and have 20 or 30 pages and the, the clockwork will actually move the system from page to page based on its state uh, as per need. So somebody presses the e-stop, the machine will go to the first initial page saying, hey, your e-stop pressed and the door's open on the safety gate and da da da, da and you haven't got any air pressure and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can do element visibility, so that means that if you've got a whole lot of warnings, instead of custom writing those warnings, at the, like displaying them at the text, you can just turn all them off and only display the one you want to see. Uh, and then the last one that I mentioned there is the time series graphing. That proved to be a godsend <laughs> uh, for uh, uh, my uh, development of a system that was indexing a 400 kilo carriage, uh, 900 mil in just over one second. <laughs> uh, without it, I wouldn't be able to do it. It was impossible, because uh, I just couldn't see what I was doing wrong. Uh, we have also done a 3D visualizations using 
are the, um, the simulation and the code, and we actually make it so that the simulation represents the bales moving through the machine and all that kind of thing. Based on open source, lots of open source components, uh, you know, and as I say, the code's BSD or GPL as the requirements are. And uh, that's about it. Um, I could show you this here if I, okay, right yeah. So let's see if we can get this working. I did get it working in the speaker's theater. <laughs> Now, is that switched? No, it's not turned on for some reason. Oh. Maybe I need to turn it on. Unfortunately, it looks like that particular device is not actually powered up. That's the power button, but it's not responding. That's unfortunate. I'll um, place it so we can see it just here. Hopefully, people will be able to see that. Um, so let's go back to the laptop and I want to see this here, there. Now I don't know how visible the, right. Right. Did that only take that one window, did it? Oh. I know that's what happened. Okay, right. That's better. Right. So um, I've got a MQTT server running on my laptop, which I've told this ESP32 about, and um, I can instruct that remotely to turn a green light on or a the red one, and that's simple, you know, nothing fancy about that, but the point is that it's possible. And so you can, exa the example would that be, uh, you might have put that behind a door switch with some lights on it and some buttons on it, and it could report that information to your household, basically. Now, the thing is, okay, that there is the continual monitoring of the CO2 monitor with a 100 millisecond update rate. No filtering or anything like that, but all possible. Um, you can see also there the transitions of states and the property value updates. So you can imagine if that was a whole lot more complex, you would be able to grep out, say, the beginning statement, so the main machine, and see that it's going idle update, but then not going back to idle. Oh, that's interesting. I need to describe that and find out why it's doing that wrong. Um, the code for that is, oops, now I've got to type things and people are watching. <laughs> uh, let's see here, um, talks, no, it talks. And, no CD. <laughs> this is hard. That's the configuration that makes that possible. Not much, not much at all. Um, and I have, we've published a set of fairly generic tool libraries that all sort of clockwork code that makes this all possible. So if I, uh, let's see, that's in a different place. So let's, uh, that one there, let's say here, there we are. So these, using my parlance, generic libraries. So um, that MQT stuff that you were looking at, um, that's the code that makes um, this work. So the very top one is the piece of code that takes that message that I sent as a number one to turn that light on. All right. 
Did we done, are we? Okay, cool. I'm happy.